was great that I started with that introduction because um, when Bruce asked me to speak, I said yes, and then I realized um, it would become my obsession for the next month. Um, and it became part of every conversation I ever had. If someone asked how I was doing, I'd say, I'm fine, but I have to give a speech on growth. <laughs> what would you talk about? It came from, ev I got every answer from, um, it's what defines you, to, no, it's not what defines you, it's how you deal with it that defines it, you. Um, and so, I was thinking, okay, is it the power of yes? Is it how we handle situations? Is it a mindset? Is it being comfortable, being uncomfortable? All of these things kept running through my mind. And um, I was having lunch with Kent Ebersol, who's on, on the board of Camber today, and um, I was still machinating on this not long ago, which probably isn't a good sign. And he said, I think it's about making shit up. It's like, you, none of us have the answers. And if we're looking forward to a full life, one where there isn't a path, we're, we're all just gonna have to make shit up at some point. And so I'm gonna start with um, my childhood. And I grew up in a small town on, um, in a small state, and I was on the rural side. I was one of three sisters, I was the youngest, and we would spend our summers, the screen door would shut, slam shut, and, am I still getting this in and out a little bit? Um, the screen door would shut, slam shut, and um, we would be out for the day. And um, as I was reflecting with Kent, he said, that's, that's making shit up at its best. Uh, we were swimming in a irrigation-fed sand pit, we would ride motorbikes, we would ride bicycles, and at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, we'd be playing kick the can with our friends. By the time I got to sixth grade, um, I still had that attitude. I was strong-willed, I was carefree, I believed I could be anything I wanted to be, and I was also really strong. By the time I got to sixth grade, I was 5'5". Five five. I was a, about a nationally ranked swimmer, I was the first person picked for baseball and football at recess, and all the boys came up to about right here. <laughs> so that by the time I went to seventh grade, I actually cared about what the boys thought. And I started to notice that something shifted in me. No longer was I proud to be asked to be on the football team, it was actually a little bit of an insult. And I started to want to fit in more. I started to realize that maybe the person that I was wasn't the person that would fit into the small town in which I grew up in. The year was 1982. I remember I stepped on the scale and I looked down and I was 110 pounds. Later that day I remember my thighs didn't touch and I had found a way to stop growing up. I had found a way to stop my matura maturation process. I would found a way to start fitting in. Fast forward to 1988, and all the boys that I cared about and the girls, my classmates, were juniors in college. They were probably looking at their applications for grad school or law school or med school or their, their first job out of university, and I was starting my third week of an eating disorder program, it was an in-house eating disorder program. And I remember thinking, my roommate isn't like this carefree woman from Oklahoma who's chasing the Grateful Dead and not wearing shoes and smoking weed. My roommate was Carol, and Carol had come in because she had a crank addiction, and she was working the night shift at the meat packing plant in Omaha. Um, and I gotta tell you, if you've ever been around someone who's coming off a crank, they snore a lot. <laughs> Throughout the day, in the middle of a conversation, Carol would fall asleep. I also wasn't planning my next, college, my next year of college or even my next semester. I was looking forward to my first um, two-hour outing. It was a supervised outing with my fellow addicts to the Henry Dorley Zoo. And let's just say at that moment, I wish I had said, I had said like, oh, I have this mindset. This is an awesome opportunity for me to really become the person that I'm gonna be. Um, no, I didn't have that at all, but I did have a sink, sneaking suspicion at that moment that my arc was not gonna be like everyone else's. And so I stand up here today because I think it's easy to see the projection 
of someone's life and think that it was um, planned or think that everything fell together or think that it's been this easy um, place where I, where I or any of us uh, see something and we go after it. And I think part of, part of our life and our life journey is realizing when, um, realizing when we have to make shit up and that we're all doing it if we want to have a life that has meaning to us and can um, take us to the places where we envision that we can be. And I've just realized that I am completely off of my slides, so I'm gonna <laughs> fast forward. Um, so um, so I, I ended up getting through school, uh, seven years, five colleges, a degree in fine arts, my parents couldn't have been prouder, opened so many doors for me career-wise that I ended up going to law school. Um, and I remember my first semester of law school, I actually had a professor call me in at the end of my first year and say, I'm not really sure if this was the right choice for you. I don't think that you made the best choice. I don't think that this fits your personality and who you are. And I had to make a decision. Um, I was already $30,000 in debt, and I thought, well, gosh, the, um, the river raft guiding um, gig probably isn't gonna pay that off anytime soon. Maybe I should just try to finish this out. And I did, I finished it out, and I actually got straight A's by the end. What I didn't know at the time was I, I had been struggling with dyslexia my entire life. And I actually didn't discover that until um, five years ago. And, um, and I show this slide because my life has been a series of valleys and peaks. And sometimes it feels like it's more valleys than peaks. And, you know, I walked out of law school, I practiced, I pieced together some practice for a little bit, and then just decided this wasn't working for me. And so I did what any person would do. I went and got a job for $10 an hour at a specialty retail shop. <laughs> Again, like it felt like a, a valley. It felt like I was at a low, but little did I know that it was actually one of the first times in my adult life that I started saying yes. I started saying, um, start doing the things that scare me because those are the things that I needed to do to continue to find my North Star and move forward. Um, and so really after that moment, um, I was 33 and I was, felt like I was restarting my career. And I have since been able to grow and move forward in a way that is building upon itself. But I still tend to bring this attitude of if, if it's something that we envision, a future that we envision that we haven't seen or that we don't know, we're gonna have to make some stuff up along the way. We're gonna have to try things out. We're gonna have to realize that there's, a, there's an opportunity to say yes a lot, and then there's also situations that come before us where maybe it's not saying yes, but it's saying we're gonna figure this out, and it seems like the industry is shifting. The opportunities are opportunities are shifting. We talked about the aging um, of the leadership in, in this industry, and that is really an opportunity for us to figure out a new way of being. I love this quote because I think it's about starting where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. And as we all try to figure our way out, and way in this world, and, and try to um, understand how to maximize those opportunities in front of us, it's really important to know where we're starting. Um, so I'm gonna pivot really quick to the organization that I, um, that I now run and the journey that I've been on since I took over. I took over about five years ago and the organization was small. I was the first full-time employee and I knew that there was opportunity. I knew that the conversation needed to shift from professional development for women to a really a bigger vision. How are we gonna become the industry that attracts the talent? How are we gonna start bringing in those people who we know love our sport, who, who plan their weekends around getting out on the slopes? And actually, if they knew that there was a job, they would come and work for us. And so, um, as I started having those conversations, more and more people started to engage with me at a higher level and with the organization. And, um, but we were still small, and I would say, so all this research shows that if the CEO signs a pledge or makes a public commitment, um, again, I'm making this shit up, <laughs> that the organization, that the company would, uh, would thrive and do a better job at attracting and retaining talent, women talent and diverse talent. 
And so I say to the people who I knew, would, would you sign a CEO pledge? And they said, sure, I, I would, but what are you, you know, how are you gonna support us? And at the time, we didn't have the means uh, to provide the support to our um, organization. So at the same time, I was asking around um, to anyone who would listen, uh, what would it take for you to give us a transformational gift? This is an imperative for our industry, and we really need um, a leader or leaders who believe in this who can invest in us and help us move it forward. So two years ago, Camber Outdoors, which was then the Outdoor Industry Women's Coalition, the longest name ever for a nonprofit, was a recipient of a $1.5 million grant from REI in honor of its founder, Mary Anderson, who is still alive today, and she's 107 years old. We, yeah. And we also launched the CEO Pledge. And I think people have heard a lot about it today. Um, and when we launched it, we had 12 companies. Today, we have 68. This morning, we had 68. And I'm proud to announce that Mountain Travel Symposium and Michael has, is the uh, 69th CEO pledge signer. So thank you. <laughs> and finally, we did um, something audacious and we completely changed our name. Uh, from the Outdoor Industry Women's Coalition to Camber Outdoors. And so I use these as examples because, I, again, I think it's easy to see people standing in front of us and thinking that we have it all figured out. I don't think we have it figured out. As an industry, I hope we don't have it figured out because the opportunities that are in front of us are amazing and awesome and inspiring. And if we can remember that we might not have the answers ourselves, but collectively, we have a genius about us. Uh, we will move forward into the next uh, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years with a vision that will help us grow and not only grow, but be more relevant and contribute more to the conversations that are important in the world. Um, so I'm gonna leave with this thought. Um, as, as leaders, um, as future and uh, current leaders, I, I, I urge all of us to think about the attitude that we bring to our personal growth. Think about the attitude that we bring to our professional growth and, and bring that attitude and that philosophy and that orientation to our industries and to our companies. Compassion, um, kindness, truth. And if we continue to collectively embrace that, we will create a future in which we can all believe in, um, in which we can all believe we can do whatever we wanna do and be whatever we want to be for both ourselves and our future generations. Thank you. <laughs>